Welcome, Eternal Life fans. It's Rowan from the Eternal Life Fan Club, and I'm going to be answering your questions for everyone that asked a question from my last video. I wanted questions, so some of you guys sent questions in the comments. Thank you, guys. I'll start out with the first question by Corey C. He says, uh, what's your view on the Book of Mormon? Honestly, I don't know much about the Book of Mormon. I've heard things because there's a lot of people in my family who were ex-Mormons. So my mom was an ex-Mormon, my grandma was an ex-Mormon, and uh, my grandpa too. So there's a lot, a lot. I know some about it, but I heard that it's like a forgery. So Joseph Smith, he could have for uh, he could have copied it from someone else. I also heard that there could be, it could be demonic. Like it could be demonically inspired maybe. I don't know much about it, but sorry, that's not the best answer. Corey C said, uh, here is a good one. Now you have, now you have come to realize Christianity being true. Do you still have the mindset to live forever on earth? I do still have the mindset to live forever on earth. Um, there's a quote by Jesus, and he said, Whoever keeps my saying will never see death. And so I tend to just take things at face value, literally. So I'm thinking maybe Jesus was literal when he said that. Like, if we just completely obey Jesus, you know, very strictly, that we would never die. We would never see death. There are a few instances of people in the Bible who never died. Okay? Like uh, one, Elijah, I think he was walking and he was taken up in a whirlwind. And um, there's just some examples like that. It makes me think it's possible to never die. Of course, having said that, <clears throat> you know, heaven, I'm still thinking, okay, heaven could be a place in the future, the kingdom of heaven is a place in the future on earth, and that, you know, God would resurrect people and then have the, the people who he chooses get into the kingdom of heaven sometime later in the future, right? I think they call that the, the millennium or whatever. There's a place, there's a time in the future where that could be heaven on earth. Of course, none of this changes the most important thing about heaven, which is that God decides who gets there. That's the most important thing about heaven. It's like, whatever you think about heaven, whether you think it's like spiritual in a different realm, or you think it's this realm in the future, or whatever. Some people think heaven's on a different planet. You know, I don't know. I don't know all these details. But the most important point about heaven and living forever is that God decides who gets to live forever. As long as you have that core element, then these other details about whether heaven is a physical or spiritual or whatever are less important. The important thing is that you're trying to get to heaven through through God, right? That God is the, the doorway to heaven. You gotta you gotta do that. Okay, oh the other, the other thing I wanted to say here about this last question is that let's say I'm thinking I'm gonna get to heaven by living forever and obeying God, and obeying Jesus, and all the rules, and um, and having forgiveness from God, and everything. I'm thinking I'm going to live for, I'm going to think I'm going to get to heaven that way, and I think it's a physical place in the future, that I have to, like, make it to that point. But that's not to say, even if I'm wrong, okay, even if I'm wrong, let's say I'm wrong, God can still kill me at any point, if God has a different plan, right? If God wants me to, if, like, God says, hey, there's What's Rowan doing? He's got to come up to here to heaven, you know, he's got to die and get to heaven. If I have to die to get to heaven, God will find some way to kill me, right? God would find some way to take me out, because God would have that power easily to just kill me. If, if, I, if I'm somehow misled to think I have to live forever, right, physically, which is, which is still what I'm going to try to do, God can, uh, God can just kill me, right? So, I'm open to that possibility as well. If I need to die to get to heaven, all right, fine. I'd rather not have to die to get to heaven, though. That's 
that's not something I don't want to die. Okay, dying is scary. Um, the next thing is uh, first name, last name asks, who are your top five favorite philosophers? Well, of course, I would say Jesus, obviously, but I'm not going to mention him in the philosophers because he's more than just a philosopher, right? He's he's too special just to be considered, just to be lumped in with all these other philosophers, right? So, clearly, I'm inspired by the philosophy of Jesus most, more than anyone else I'm about to list. But if I would say the top five philosophers, it would be Wonka, Willy Wonka, because he's just awesome. Watch the movie, you'll get you'll get you'll get the download of all the philosophy of Willy Wonka, and it's just awesome. He's into the pure imagination, staying youthful uh, in spirit, and um, he's into really he's like a judgmental guy too. I, I believe in in judgment, right? Just like Jesus, he was judgmental to the Pharisees in when he was cleansing the temple, Wonka has that kind of same judgmental vibe that I love, okay? And he was into testing people. Wonka was testing all the children. And that, that takes like a very strategic, high level of thinking to be like testing people, right? That's a high level of philosophy, and Willy Wonka showed that. So. I'm inspired by Willy Wonka's philosophy. Plus, he's just this creative inventor type of person that I want to be. I want to be creative. I want to invent things. And uh, ultimately, like, you know, my factory is like, how do I got to figure out the cure for aging and things like that? How do I figure out how to be as healthy as possible? Right? So I just, I, I'm inspired by the, that inventor spirit that Wonka had. Mary Poppins would be another one, like big one, and that is uh, because she's she's like into she's like the perfectionist. She's the ultimate symbol of like the perfectionist vibe. She's talked about you know, Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way. Like that's what we need to be inspired to be practically perfect. If we can't be perfect, well, well let's be let's it's, let's aspire to be as perfect as possible. And that's what Jesus said too. He said, "Be perfect, you know, as your heavenly Father is perfect." Right? We're supposed to try to be perfect. We're supposed to try to obey all the rules. Uh, you know, it's like that's part of it. And uh, yeah, Mary Poppins for so many other reasons. She also had that like very open-mindedness, imagination, like that childlike spirit that. Uh, once again, that comes back to Jesus. You know, Jesus was like, he who humbles himself like these children, they're going to be the first in the kingdom of heaven. Like, He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, unless you humble yourself like these children, you're not going to make it to heaven. Something like that. Right? It's that idea that there's some special characteristics of and humility in children that we should model ourselves after. That we should try to have that humble spirit, an open-mindedness, an imagination, curiosity, and everything that's good about that. You can also find that same philosophy in uh, Alice in Wonderland when they said, uh, when Willy Wonka was talking about, I mean, when when the Mad Hatter, very similar to Willy Wonka in a character, when the Mad Hatter was talking about muchness and he was like telling Alice, hey, you've lost your muchness. And she's like, muchness? You're not the same as you were before. You were much more much here. You've lost your muchness. My muchness. In there, something's missing. It's muchness is that same thing. It's that quality that Jesus wants us to have, that muchness. 
You gotta have it. You can't lose it. All right? So, there's that. Schindler would be my next philosopher, and he's symbolic of the idea of just saving lives. Schindler was all about saving human lives and valuing human lives. And he was like, also with that perfectionistic attitude that it wasn't enough. As much as much people as Schindler saved, he saved a lot of people, a lot of Jews. But he was like, no, I didn't do enough. I should have got more. I could have gotten more Jews if I had just given up my ring. If I had just, you know, all these material possessions he had had. He, he was like, hey, if I just sold this stuff, I could have saved even more people. Like, what? And he was judging himself because he didn't do enough. And, um... That is an, a philosophy I carry with me. That I'm here to, like, save people. That hero mentality that Schindler had. You know, Jesus was all about saving people. We're supposed to be saving people. We're supposed to be sharing the gospel and getting people saved. You know, and even Jesus talked about the Great Commission. Going out there into the world and spreading the gospel as far to everyone on earth. That is part of saving people. We're supposed to get people saved. You know, just like Schindler, just like Jesus, right? We're supposed to be saving people. Of course, you know, Schindler's just saving people physically, and Jesus is saving their soul. So there's a difference there, but still, we also want to be saving people just from physical, their needs, right? If they're poor, if they don't have money, if they don't have food, we've got to be helping people helping the poor, and Jesus was all about that philosophy as well, helping um, helping the poor, not being greedy with your material possessions and, and doing what you can to, to help other people. Um, Noah. Noah is one of my favorite biblical characters. I love the movie with Russell Crowe, and... Um, what can I say? Noah is like the ultimate, he's like the prepper. He's like the symbolic of like the survivalist prepper. And he must have been pretty virtuous because God chose him, after all, to, to, to save the animals and to survive and to live. And um, there's got to be something about Noah that's special. I also, Noah strikes me as being very obedient to God which I want to be. I want to have that obedience that like, I'll just do the mission. And Noah was like dedicated to God, the mission he was given from God. Right? And that is inspirational to me and I want to have that attitude that Noah had. And then there's Lilu from the fifth element. She's my fifth favorite philosopher because um, she's symbolic of like love and the value of that and that love is something worth saving which is an idea you find in the fifth element and uh, also she was if you notice there's a scene in the fifth element where Lilo is is she's very against war and she's seeing all these graphic pictures of all the destructive things that the humans do and the war, and the violence, and the murder, and everything. And she's seeing all this, and she's like crying. She's weeping for all this evil things that humans have done. And uh, that inspires me as a philosophy, because like, we should be saddened. We should have that emotional, we should have that emotional sadness for seeing all the evil in the world, and uh, it should inspire us to uh, try to fix things, you know, fix the problems, fix the, the evil with the, the corrupt governments and everything that's going on. So, there's that, right? There's just a lot of human suffering. So, Lilo strikes me as like the person who like looks at the world, sees all the suffering of humanity, sees all the evil, and she's just, you know, it stresses her out, right? Like, we got to be a little stressed. You can't do you can't be too comfortable in this life when there's too many people suffering and everything. And I think that's also also, also the message of Jesus. So it's like you can see how a lot of the philosophies of all these different people 
it does tie back into Jesus. Jesus kind of carries all the philosophies, like all the best stuff. It's all there hidden with Jesus. Like Jesus, he didn't really miss anything. You know what I mean? He covers the most important philosophies if you really get into the words of Jesus and the, everything like that. Um, the next question is, first name, last name, what are your thoughts on the effects of technology on society? I'm, I like it. I like technology, especially the internet. Obviously, the internet's doing so much good um, as far as giving us access to knowledge and information that can save us. And what did, what did the Bible say? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, right? We have more access to knowledge than ever before. Like, so the internet's awesome. Of course, YouTube and everything, like, that's cool. Like, even just have the ability to make this video with a camera and just, like, very, very cool. Like, we're, we're we should be kind of shocked looking, looking at it all from the bird's eye view, like, wow, we're, this is amazing, what we already have access to. And then the technology that's giving us access to the best supplements and the best, you know, everything that for our health, like, we've never had access like that before. We have it better than ever before. Um, so technology overall is just a net positive good thing. Obviously, there's negative things too. Obviously, like, even like traveling, Traveling is becoming safer because the technology is getting better like the technology for cars is getting safer The technology for planes is getting safer. Although I heard recently there was like a catastrophe with some planes and like a lot of people died and everything but um, Boeing right Boeing some corruption and they did some horrible things and released some planes that were like really Really not ready to fly and they had all kinds of dangers and like tons of people end up dying from that. That's a whole nother story. So technology ultimately is getting better and it's going to be safer and it's going to allow us to live longer. And ultimately there could be something from technology that that can allow us um, um, to, for our health. We could, maybe something in technology could cure aging, something like that. Elizabeth Holmes, she came out with this awesome technology that was that was gonna like test your blood with just a little drop of blood and then you can see your whole nutrient status and everything that's wrong with you and it will test your genetics and everything. So it's like the amazing access we'll have to special testing that will get information about our health and we could use that information to uh, live longer. The more knowledge is power. So the more knowledge we have about our own body, we can do specialized uh, plan, a health plan for us based on our own individual needs, looking at our blood, right? And there's just all kinds of technology like that. So technology is awesome. Um, as far as a negative thing about technology, you know, honestly, I can't think of much negative things. I mean, people use technology in a bad way. You could look at war and you say people have nuclear missiles and that's technology. And we dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and just killed all these innocent people. And there's tons of collateral damage and, you know, depleted uranium coming from missiles and everything. It's causing all kinds of deformities and everything. And so you can look at the horrible things of technology. It's more about how people use it. Next question, first name, last name is, uh, in light of your now following Christ, what are your thoughts on Zoltan Istvan's transhumanism? So Zoltan is, um, he's awesome. I mean, as far as his philosophy, look, he's, he's got a good intention. So he's trying to help us cure aging. And from his vantage point, right, I can totally understand everything where he's coming from. And, um, you know, there's things on about transhumanism I disagree with. But, like, there's nothing really specific to Zoltan Isfahan's brand of transhumanism that I'm against. It's more just transhumanism in general. So to pick on Zoltan's philosophy would be unfair when really it's like all the transhumanists, most of the transhumanists have a lot, some bad ideas, right? Such as 
that we can just replace all the body with robotic parts. This is a common idea in transhumanism that they, we, we could just lose the organic body. And that's not something I believe in. I believe that there's something intrinsically special about, you know, the organic flesh body that we have. I think we're designed to have this body for a reason. I think God gave us this body, you know, and to just think that we can just, you know, replace the body with robotic parts and just become a robot or something. I think you would lose your humanness in that process. And you would probably lose your soul. Something like that could be the mark of the beast, right? Where people get brain implants and they're getting brain implants for special enhancements in the brain and they're thinking that they're going to need this brain implant for all, the, you know, to compete with all these other people who have their brain implants. And this is kind of a, a transhumanist idea to become a cyborg and to accept all this technology into yourself. And that's not something I don't, I don't want technology implanted in my body and everything. That's too weird. And that's, I see dangers in that. Um... Right, there's just things like about that, of transhumanist ideas. I mean, even like the idea of sex bots is very popular in transhumanism in general. A lot of transhumanists promote that. I've changed my views on sex bots. I don't advocate for sex bots anymore. They're completely degenerate, disgusting, gross, uh, a perversion, and it's not the way it's supposed to be. And transhumanists are just too accepting of some of these uh, technologies that... Uh, have potential downsides and they're not, not really showing the downsides of the technology and how it can ruin people and ruin society in general. Sex bots is just one of those examples. And of course, you know, the implants and all these weird stuff that people do. Like, uh, I think that the problem with transhumanism in general is that these people aren't, these people aren't, um, fearful of God. That's really what it comes down to. They don't have the fear of God because transhumanism in general is about like trying to invent God with technology. Like the, the technology will replace God, will become, that will become God and everything. It's like a reach for power. That's what transhumanism is. It's like a reach for as most power as you possibly can get. And I get that. Like that people want power because power will help you survive. It, it, so it seems in this world. But if there's a God, that changes things. And that's what the transhumanists really aren't acknowledging. I don't see many transhumanists acknowledging the power of God, that there's a judgmental God that ultimately decides who gets to live forever and who doesn't. The transhumanists are reaching for eternal life, but it's like, you can't just reach for eternal life and ignore God because the God over here could have all the power. And as much as you're reaching for eternal life, your attempt is going to fail unless God is on your side. That's the issue with transhumanism. They're not seeking after the God that could really ultimately be the only way to get eternal life. And that without that God, you're, not, you're going to fail. You're going to die. And that God could destroy you if you've disobeyed the rules. That's the main thing that all the transhumanists, you know, I don't want to just pick on one or the other. It's like all the transhumanists don't get the God thing right. So they have the same, the, the atheistic mentality that is um, fearless, fearless in the face of the possibility of a God. And they should be more fearful of God, you know. But uh, anyways... That's about it. I mean, there's, I mean, obviously I respect the, of transhumanists, I respect the focus on survival, the, the focus on like wanting to survive and live forever. Like that's a big thing in transhumanists too. And that's good. But the focus on living forever, the strategy on how to live forever is a little bit misguided, a lot misguided. If they're not trying to include God in the equation. Okay, so my question to transhumanists in general would be like, why aren't you considering more that uh, the God here is the 
authority and that you're trying to sub submit to that authority because the authority of God gets to decide who lives forever. Get that what I'm saying? So they're not doing that. That's the problem. Uh, and that's what the Bible's all about. I mean, really, that's what the Bible's about. It's about submitting to God's authority and admitting our and the, the, the humility. When Jesus was saying he you got to humble yourself like this little child. What he's saying is, it takes humility to just say, "Look, there could be, there there could be, or it, uh, there is. I say there is a God, but at least say there could be a God and have that humility to admit that, and then that's where the humility is about. It's admitting that you're not the you're not the boss. Like there's the God is the boss." That's what it's about, having humility. Um, and if you're just thinking, well, I'll just become God, and I'll just use technology to live forever, and that no one's going to stop me and everything, that's not humble. That's not humble. So the transhumanists are lacking the muchness. The muchness. you got to have your muchness. Don't lose your muchness. The muchness is about humility. You get what I'm saying here? Yeah, that's that's it, man. All right, those are some of my criticisms of transhumanism in general. That's that's it. But uh, I'm on board with curing aging. I'm on board with curing aging, but um, I don't get the whole like let's replace our whole bodies. You know what I mean? I want to cure aging, and I think we 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 should we could cure aging and and the cure for aging that could be something like god gives us god gives society as a gift and ultimately if we cure aging that that's still still the power is in god's hands of who gets to live forever it's just that god could want eventually society to cure aging you know so that the people in that society are blessed with a longer lifespan and that their test the, 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 the time period that God is testing them is expanded. So they have a longer time and God gets to see what they're doing in a longer amount of time, a longer lifespan, but God ultimately is still testing them all. So just if we cure aging, that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, it's like God's still in control of that whole system. And just because you cured aging doesn't mean that you still don't also have to submit to God and obey all the rules, because ultimately God can take you out. If you cure aging, God could destroy you in any other number of ways. So, it still leaves the power with God. Um, anyways, I've went on too long. This is good enough, right? Thank you guys for the questions, and may you live forever.